I wanted to bring today's episode to the podcast talking about what to do next after you have read the book, It Starts With The Egg. Most people that come to see me, they have read this book. They have made the supplement recommendations. They've changed the diet. They've made the lifestyle recommendations, but it still hasn't worked. So I wanted to take a functional spin on this book, really how we would look at some of the recommendations a little bit differently, where we would dig in a little further, what we see is regularly missed. So I'm excited for you to listen to this episode and thanks a lot for being here. Hey there, thanks so much for listening to the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast. And I've got a favorite to ask you if you are enjoying learning about the functional approach to fertility, consider going to iTunes and rating and reviewing the podcast. This is how it helps the show reach more people that are struggling with infertility, knowing that there's another approach that really can get to the bottom of why it's not working in the first place. So all you need to do is if you're on the app or the desktop, just go in and consider leaving a five-star rating and leave a review. And there is step-by-step instructions in the show notes showing you exactly how to do that. So if you can just take a few minutes, just take a few minutes right now. You can pause this this recording, come back, leave the review. It would really mean the world to me and help others that are on the fertility journey as well. Take care. Hey there. I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have two spots available per month to work with us. So the Supercharger Fertility Discovery Call is for action takers and really people who are ready to move forward so they can finally have their baby. And if you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. So if you're seriously considering working with us, go to fabfertile, F-A-B-fertile.com and click on book a free call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. That's fabfertile, F-A-B-fertile.com and click on book a free call. One theme that keeps coming up with the couples in our Fab Fertile Couples Coaching Program is sleep. Whether it's insomnia, having a hard time falling asleep, waking up at night, or feeling tired when we wake up, sleep is critical for fertility and hormones. And that's why I'm so excited to have Blue Blocks as our podcast sponsor. So we're exposed to blue and green light from our phones, our tablets, our computers, indoor lights, and more. And this exposure impacts our melatonin production. And melatonin is essential for both female and male fertility. It helps determine the frequency and duration of our cycle and impacts sperm. There's lots of blue light blocking glasses on the market, but the ones from Blue Blocks, they've actually compared other popular brands and Blue Blocks block 100% of blue and green light while other brands fall short. So I have their sleep glasses. They have red lenses and the ones I have are a little translucent uh, frame and they're so stylish and really cool. And so they eliminate 100% of the blue and green light in the 400 nanometer to 550 nanometer nanometer range. So this is exact range has been shown in clinical studies to disrupt melatonin and negatively impact your sleep. So all you do is wear your sleep glasses after sunset until it's time for bed and you'll notice improved sleep after just one use. And it's also cool to use when you're flying for managing jet lag. So I got to say I was a little skeptical about the noticing uh, improvement after one use, but literally I I use these glasses and my sleep is actually already pretty good. I use them for one day and I have to say after one day, I had the best sleep of my life. I just felt so rested. So these glasses, they ship free and they're tracked for all orders anywhere in the world. And also they have all their frames come in prescription, non-prescription and reading glasses. Plus you can send in your frames and they'll add the blue light blocking and green light blocking lenses to your frame. So this is an easy hack that you can add to your fertility toolkit. All you do is go to blueblocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com. Use the coupon code Get pregnant podcast at checkout and receive a 15% discount. That's blueblocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com and use the coupon code get pregnant podcast to receive your 15% discount. I didn't need to go to donor eggs. Obviously, Mm -hmm. I don't regret it. I have beautiful children. I could have done things differently, restored. I was still cycling back in my in my 20s. I could have looked at my health, the environmental toxins, the stress I was under. Many, many women are being told their eggs are too old. That's often merely an assumption that's not based on actual evidence. The reason being that there is no direct test of egg quality. You can't test egg quality. It's the man who's got a food sensitivity or he has a zinc deficiency. Like there can be a root cause to these symptoms that are, you know, quote unquote, period problems that the doctor will pass you a pill without any question of why. And some part of you knows that if you can reframe your journey 
from not one of struggle, or if it is struggle, learn how to embrace the struggle. Learn how to embrace it. Most conditions in the child occur during the nine months of development. It's the, the genetic switches are turned on or turned off and they're pre-programmed. So you are in such a powerful, amazing position to do amazing things for your kids. You know, why is IVF the first step? Because we believe it should be the last step. Welcome to Get Pregnant Naturally, where functional medicine and natural fertility solutions will help you get pregnant and have your baby. Hey there, I'm Sarah Clark, founder of Fat Fertile and your host. I believe the functional approach is the first step for anyone struggling with infertility, and my aim is to help you get pregnant naturally. Today, I'm welcoming Brandy Busco back to the podcast, and we're digging into what to do after you've read the book, It Starts With the Egg by Rebecca Fett. So this episode is for you if you've implemented the suggestions in the book, but it still hasn't worked. If you were so overwhelmed by the book, you didn't know where to start that your partner isn't making any of the suggested changes. It's just you. And we're going to be digging into the details. So if you're really confused of what to do next, we're going to be talking about what to do if your TSH is normal. So if your thyroid is normal and what we see that's being missed, what to do, what does low vitamin D actually mean? And what to do about if you are supplementing, what could be missed? We're talking about diet. So we're digging into food sensitivities and what we see that is regularly missed. Uh, What to do if you're supplementing with melatonin and what we see on testing that could be an indicator of something else is going on. So supplementing with melatonin, what's being missed there. Uh, What we see with DHEA, that is typically something we see people are supplementing with. What is, again, missed there. What to do if you've tossed out all the toxic products, you're eating organic, and you feel like IVF is your obvious next step. What we see from a functional standpoint that can be missed. Definitely check out episode six for a functional medicine 101 talk, plus a look at some of the tools we use to help couples conceive. And Brandy's part of my team here at Fab Fertile, and she's an integral part of our couples coaching program, which uses functional lab testing, diet and lifestyle changes to dramatically improve conception. So if you are struggling with infertility, your body is desperately trying to tell you something and focusing on your health will either help you get pregnant naturally, or if you do need to go to the fertility clinic, it'll improve your chances of success. So she's a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner certified transformational health coach, an emotional freedom technique practitioner, and she loves supporting women so they can learn how functional medicine addresses the underlying cause of disease or illness. And so thanks so much for listening. I'm really grateful that you are here. Make sure you hit subscribe. And if you know someone else who's on the fertility journey, please share this podcast with them. Okay, so before we jump into this, I wanted to refer you to the disclaimer at the end of the podcast. I'm just going to talk about it now too. Uh, You know that we are not doctors, so be sure to consult your physician before making any of these changes. Our goal is always to educate you so you can be empowered to know that there's many changes that you can make right now that'll help you get pregnant naturally or improve your chances with IVF. So as we were talking about today, we're going to be digging into the book. It starts with the egg by Rebecca Fett. And so the first one was published in 2014, the same year that my book, Fabulously Fertile, was published. And the second edition came out in 2019. So this book, everyone, I, I say a high percentage of the people I regularly speak with and, the, and that we work with, they have read It Starts with the Egg. And it's really become the, the Bible of the fertility community. There's a lot of really great research in there, studies, uh, actionable steps. Now, the thing is, why you want to do this podcast and talk about it is that some of those recommendations can be generalized. Obviously, she's she's pulling it from studies. And so we we here with the functional approach take a very personalized, customized, targeted approach that's right for you. And a lot of the recommendations in there potentially could be overwhelming. Many people I speak to have done a lot of the changes. Other people read the book and are like, I don't even know where to start. So we, as we said before, we focus on the whole body. We don't focus on symptoms. And our goal is to reduce the stressors on the body. So with that, I wanted to give some tips to help you of what to do next after reading It Starts with the Egg. So just and just before we get into that, so it takes 90 days for the egg to renew itself and the life cycle of the sperm is 70 to 80 days. So in that really short period of time, you can take, make major changes to your fertility for both male and female fertility. We're going to be talking about supplements a little bit later, but first we're going to start, start talking about, first one is vitamin D. This is something that we see quite regularly with vitamin D being quite low in, in the single digits or teens. 
So let's uh, let's talk about that one, Brandy, vitamin D. Yeah, so I mean, even if you live in a warm climate like California or Florida, we still see people with low vitamin D levels. The important thing to understand about vitamin D is that it is actually considered a pro-hormone. So you do need to be really careful about monitoring and supplementation. So if you're supplementing with large amounts, you need to be monitoring what's happening with your blood levels. The other thing that's important to know with regards to any vitamin or mineral is that they work synergistically with either vitamins and minerals in the body. So when you find vitamin D in nature, it's not by itself. It's always coupled with other vitamins and nutrients. So if you're just supplementing with vitamin D, but your calcium levels are off or your vitamin K2 levels are off, then you're not going to be able to utilize that vitamin D properly. And so this is why um, we talk about this whole person approach and not just focusing on the supplement itself, but trying as much as possible to get it in the most natural form through whole foods, nutrient dense foods. But we do find that there are many people that do need to supplement because their levels are low. Functionally, like a functional range, um, it can range anywhere ideally from 60 to 80 is what we we ideally would like to see it. Um, Many times we do see people come with to us and their their vitamin D levels are in the 30s. So that definitely does have an impact on fertility. It also has an impact on your immune system. You may have been hearing more and more about vitamin D lately because of um, viruses that are going around and how it benefits the immune system. But it's also really important not to take vitamin D in isolation. So we always recommend taking a vitamin D3 supplement with K2 so that it has their its cofactors with it so that your body can actually utilize it and absorb it correctly. Yeah, this is something that we see if there's if there's autoimmunity, so definitely looking at there's correlation with autoimmune with with low vitamin D and we're also seeing it with low levels of vitamin D can be linked with their SIBO or parasites, uh, giard- giardia candida, worms, and also, yeah, so again, back to that autoimmune. So over 50 million Americans have an autoimmune disease and many are not diagnosed. So looking, we regularly will see a lot of it is more potentially celiac or Hashimoto's that's being, it's undiagnosed. And we're looking at a blood chemistry review, doing a full um, review using functional levels. So it's for, for healthy people, whereas for the conventional side of things, it's for people with disease. So it just flags it earlier. Again, it's not to diagnose, it's to educate. And then whatever, whatever findings, whatever's flagged, then you would take that to your physician. To me, and, and what, what Brainy was saying, it's not just looking at the, the vitamin D and yes, you can supplement. Well, well, the functional approach is, well, why is it low to begin with? Yeah. And it's important just because you have low vitamin D doesn't mean that you have some autoimmune disease. Yeah. Um, so I want to make that clear. It's actually very common. You know, we've had people who've come to us who are taking 10,000 IUs, you know, a couple times a week and they've been taking it for a couple months and their levels still haven't shifted and they ask why. Well, there's, like Sarah alluded to, there's a few reasons. It could be that it's missing the cofactors, so your body can't use them. There is problems with too much vitamin D. So if you're taking too much, it can actually cause issues if you're taking too much and not absorbing it. But then the question is, why aren't you absorbing it? Are you taking a pill form and it's it has to be absorbed in the gut and there's some issues with the gut like leaky gut or food sensitivities that are causing issues with the gut and you're not able to absorb your nutrients correctly. Is there some toxins in the gut? Is there some pathogens in the gut? So that's why you always have to ask the question, if something is low and you know you're supplementing, but the levels are still not changing, why is that? Is it an absorption issue? Is it a cofactor issue? There's a lot of things to really look at and think about. Um, just adding in the supplement isn't a surefire way to bring your numbers and back to it to normal. And a good episode to check out is what vitamin D levels mean for fertility. We go into uber detail about vitamin D and fertility. So that would be a good one to check out on the podcast. So vitamin D levels, lower ones can be um, prevalent in miscarriage and then also um, a lower instance of natural killer cells. So looking at vitamin D and figuring out why is, is as in it starts with the egg is a good place to start. And also when you are supplementing, making sure that you're getting your, your levels tested regularly with, with a physician. So the next one we have is hypothyroidism. So we see this very rare, rarely and this is something that I have 
yeah, we see with a lot of people when we, we do the people get focused on uh, the TSH and being told it's normal. When we dig into the full panel, we, we find that there's definitely healing opportunities in there. So thyroid problems are actually common with POF, so premature ovarian failure, premature ovarian insufficiency, unexplained infertility, ovulatory disorders, um, and also there's a link with miscarriage, with antibodies, miscarriage rates are actually doubled. Um, some of those studies are from uh, mentioned in It Starts With the Egg. So really the thyroid piece is um, is key to look into. And then also recent studies, so 4% of healthy women are found to have subclinical uh, hypothyroidism. The rate increased to 15% with ovulatory infertility and 40% with women with POF. And we you know, regularly see the thyroid uh, thyroid dysfunction. So let's talk about the thyroid a little bit, Brandy. It's a huge topic. Most of the time, the thyroid isn't the problem. So you there's issues with the thyroid, but what's important to understand is that the thyroid is part of a system of endocrine glands and they all communicate together. And so if there is a problem or a weak link in one of those glands, the communication system between the glands becomes broken and they get mis mixed signals and miscommunication. For example, the thyroid is very highly tied to the adrenal glands. And so if the adrenal glands are having issues because you're under an extreme amount of stress, you're pumping out a ton of cortisol and your adrenal glands are signaling to the rest of the body, we're under attack, I'm pumping out all this cortisol, you need to slow down production of, of the thyroid and slow down production of hormones, then they're, they're going to get mixed signals and you'll start to have thyroid symptoms, thinking that it's your thyroid that's the problem, when in reality, the problem is the stress, not necessarily the thyroid. The thyroid is just responding to the messages that it's getting. So that's an important thing to know. And so you mentioned subclinical hypothyroidism. That's where people have thyroid symptoms, but it's not actually the thyroid that's the problem. It's the other things that are going on that are sending signals to the thyroid to slow down production, slow down conversion, and then you start to get thyroid symptoms. And so it is important for your thyroid to be in balance and, and working optimally because it is one of the master regulators. It regulates metabolism, it regulates temperature. So these things are really important, but your thyroid is not going to function properly if you're under a lot of stress, if uh, you've got some... Now, stress encompasses a lot of things, food sensitivities, blood sugar issues, you're not sleeping, you could have gut infections, maybe you had a car accident and you've been injured and you have an injury that's just been nagging you for months, that's a stress. If there's work issues, like you hate your job and getting up to go to work every day is you dread it, that's a stress. And so it's really important to understand that when you're looking at the thyroid or anything at the body, we always have to ask the question, what else is going on? And so we do have a lot of women who come to us who are on thyroid medication, but they still don't feel well. Well, because the medication was a band-aid, it didn't fix the original problem. And a lot of times it's also important to understand that in order to see what's going on with your thyroid, you need a full picture. So as Sarah mentioned, you can't just go with a TSH. And if your TSH looks normal, you're going to feel 100% because most of the time women do not. Their, th their TSH looks fine, but they don't feel well. They still have those symptoms. And so by doing a full thyroid panel, we can actually see is your body converting inactive thyroid hormone hormone to active thyroid hormone. So a lot of things like Synthroid or levothyroxine is T4 only. Well, T4 is inactive thyroid. It needs to be converted to T3 to be used by the cells. And some of that conversion can happen in the liver and it can happen in the gut. And if there's any dysfunction there, that conversion is not going to happen properly. So again, we need to always take a step back and think, why is there an issue with my thyroid? Why am I having these symptoms? And start to address those rather than just relying on the number on the paper and a medication to try to fix it. Yeah, which is that, that Band-Aid approach and that myopic focusing on instead of looking at the whole body. So definitely check out, we have this because this is an issue with a lot of people that we work with. I've got a lot of episodes on this. So there's the link between thyroid dysfunction and fertility, the AIP diet, so the autoimmune protocol diet and Hashimoto's and why this matters if you're TTC, you're trying to conceive. 
So um, and that one is, there's a, a study in the Journal of American Medicine talking about the efficacy of the AIP diet and how it helped um, reduce many factors for improved lifestyle factors for people with Hashimoto's. Well, lots to help there. So that would be the thyroid. The next one we have is celiac. So I think, so there's a study and they talked about in the book and it starts with the eggs. A thousand women undergoing IVF, less than 2% had celiac antibodies, same as the general population. What we typically see is that there is people that either have undiagnosed celiac disease or they have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Just going to back this up a little bit. So people that also have, um, you can start a gluten-free diet, which helps, and Brandy will talk about this in a minute, but gluten-free diet, which helps the process of rebalancing folate and homocysteine levels, but then nutrient deficiencies can still be prevalent. And that's why we do a hair tissue mineral analysis test to really dig into well, why are your why are your, your mineral stored, your, your mineral balances that could be lower and imbalanced. So we see that a lot. But with a non the non-celiac gluten sensitivity is something that I have myself. And I say a high percentage of people that we work with, they have a sensitivity to gluten. So in the book, she is they are recommending obviously to see if you have celiac. But with that, with a celiac test, there's a lot of false negatives. Yeah. And so this is this is something that's really, really common. I would say that there's a very small percentage of the population that actually has celiac disease because that is the autoimmune version where when you eat gluten or wheat, your immune system attacks your gut and attacks your body. Um, so there is a very small percentage of people that have celiac disease. What's more prevalent is non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So you don't actually have the autoimmunity, but whenever you do eat gluten or wheat, your body is creating antibodies to it and it's not able to digest it correctly and it's wreaking havoc on the gut, which then also wreaks havoc on absorption of nutrients. And we know that you do need certain nutrients for optimal fertility. One example of that is cholesterol and fats. Those are the most important components for manufacturing hormones. And so if you aren't absorbing those nutrients, you could be eating the best diet in the world, but you're also eating gluten, you may not be absorbing those amazing fats and in turn are not able to produce hormones because you don't have the building blocks. The problem with celiac testing is many people will probably come back and it's negative, which could be true, but it may not because with the standard testing that's done, they're only looking at a very small percentage or a very small handful of gluten proteins and peptides. Um, and there are many, um, I believe it's 64 gluten peptides and proteins out there. And if your doctor's only checking for four and you're negative, what if you're positive to one of the other 60? proteins or peptides out there. So it's a very, very common thing. Um, one of the, the mentors that I've, I've trained with, Dr. Tom O'Brien, he's an expert on gluten sensitivity. Um, I know he did a podcast with Sarah and he talks a lot about this, but there are some studies that may show that no human can really digest gluten correctly. There's always going to be some sort of impairment to digesting gluten in wheat. Some people, you know, it will, it will attack their digestion for an hour or two and then they're better and they're fine. For other people, a tiny crumb of gluten can set them off for two or three months. So this is something where just because you know, okay, I, I eat wheat, I feel fine. I had a celiac test. I came back negative. It's fine. Not necessarily. I really challenge people to remove it from their diet for at least a month, 30 days, and then try it again. And you will discover symptoms that you weren't aware of when you bring it back into your diet. And I would trust your body's signals than a test that may or may not be a hundred percent accurate. That's right. And especially if you have unexplained infertility, unexplained mm -hmm. miscarriage, thyroid disease, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, anyone in your family has a history of celiac. And if you have aut of autoimmunity to really dig into taking the gluten out, um, we use, we have access to testing uh, from Vibrant Wellness and there's a Zoomer panel. Do you want to talk about that briefly? Yeah. So one of the tests that we do, you know, we, we do have access to and we can look at is um, it's called the Wheat Zoomer. Um, so it dives into several of the markers of wheat, uh, including um, looking at some markers to leaky gut or intestinal permeability, which could give us some clues that you perhaps are not absorbing all of your nutrients, which is a problem. The important thing that also to mention is going gluten-free, while it seems 
easy in in theory. There's a lot of places that gluten and wheat can hide that you might not think of. So, you know, if you think that gluten is a problem, um, you definitely want to reach out or work with somebody. I know there's probably, there is a lot of resources on the internet that are helpful, but really make sure that you are truly going gluten-free. Um, there is wheat byproducts that can be in personal care products. They use it as thickeners and shampoos and conditioners. There are wheat byproducts that are in some foods that you wouldn't even think. One new one that uh, I became aware of from one of my mentors is it's meat glue, which sounds really disgusting, but um, there's some meat plants that when they're taking just pieces of meat and kind of sticking them back together to like present that nice juicy steak to you in the in the shop in the you know the grocery store and there's some wheat in in that substance that's putting those pieces of meat together Mm. honestly i think it i mean if you were celiac that would be probably an issue for you more so than maybe somebody with gluten sensitivity, but there's just a lot of different places that it can hide. And so um, just, you know, avoiding bread and crackers and pasta and thinking you're good, you really need to make sure you're reading your labels. You know, you might want to try making your entire house gluten-free. And then if you still aren't feeling better and you're having issues, it might be worth thinking about gluten cross reactors, which is another rabbit hole that you know, I don't want to overwhelm people, but there are some other foods that when your body, you eat them, your body sees them as wheat. So dairy is a very common one. And that's why very often you'll hear people say, avoid dairy and wheat because they cross react with each other. Um, Oats are a very big one. Coffee is a big cross reactor. Chocolate is a big cross reactor. Corn can be a cross reactor as well. So, you know, if you've tried just taking wheat out and you're not feeling 100%, that's when maybe you might think about doing a food sensitivity test or um, a, a Zoomer test to maybe look at some of those cross reactors and see if maybe that um, is causing some havoc for you. And it does take time and patience, but you will notice a difference when you start to take those foods out and it will actually help and allow your gut to do what it likes to, which is to renew and heal itself. And that in turn will allow you to um, absorb all those amazing nutrients from the foods you're eating. Yeah. If you've been gluten or dairy free for 60 to 90 days and you're not pregnant yet, it's really time to dig into testing. So that's, that's where we would go next, but definitely check out the episode with Tom O'Brien. So is gluten causing infertility? It's just an awesome episode. And the next one we talk about in the book, it starts with the egg is periodontal disease. The, the findings in there saying it's taking two months longer, longer to conceive people that have gum disease. Any, any take on that one, Brandy? Yeah, and that's not surprising. Again, it's a whole body approach. If you have periodontal disease, which is basically infections in the mouth, it's very likely that you have infections in other places in the body. And it's, it's, it's a sign that your state, your body is not in a state of optimal health. So, um, there's very clearly some connections between periodontal disease and heart disease. There, are, I think there are some connections between period, long-term periodontal disease and cancer because it's an infection. So, you know, if you've got this infection and you've got poor oral health, it's going to impact the health of the rest of your body. So it's definitely something that you want to get addressed. Ideally, you know, you want to be working with a biological dentist who is very holistically minded and does, you know, does things gently, especially if you have something like amalgams in your mouth or metal fillings, they know how to remove those safely. So they're not exposing you to any of the the off-gassing of the metals when they're being removed. So, you know, if you have issues with your mouth, now's a good time to go get it looked at and check before you get pregnant, because while you're pregnant and afterwards, your nutrients are so depleted, the health of your mouth can actually become worse. So I would definitely address it beforehand. Yeah, and definitely check out the episode I did with uh, Dr. Berhana. He we, we talked about sleep and sleep apnea, but we also talk about the microbiome, your oral microbiome. So definitely check out check out that episode with him. He is a biological dentist and super super smart. The next one we have is environmental toxins. We've talked a lot about this on the podcast. And in the book, it starts with the egg. She talks about BPA, phthalates, plastics, and so being being linked to infertility, miscarriage, lower sperm counts. So definitely check out how to reduce toxins that impact fertility. An episode on the podcast, are your personal care products impact, 
impacting fertility. And I just did one recently, how to protect your fertility from EMF exposure. So those environmental toxins are those stressors we talked about in the beginning. So the food sensitivities, the gut infections, environmental toxins, mental emotional stress, the structural stress and, and blood sugar and the like. So anything you wanted to say about environmental toxins? Yeah. So it's important to know, not only do they burden your liver, um, which, you know, your liver is in a very important organ in the body, which helps, you know, detoxify any toxins. Um, we are inundated with so many toxins in our world that our liver, a lot of times our livers are, are struggling. Um, but uh, some of these environmental toxins that you mentioned, like the plastics and the BPA and the phthalates and all of those, they're endocrine disruptors. So when they're in the body, they disrupt the communication between the endocrine glands, which is what we talked about before with, you know, the hypothalamus and the, and the thyroid and the adrenal glands and the ovaries or the testes. Um, so anything that comes into the body that can disrupt that communication can then cause mixed messages between all of those glands. And that's why it's important to really look at personal care products and cleaning products and the like. Absolutely. So the next one we have is carbohydrates and fertility. So we talk a lot about with our clients to help them balance blood sugar levels and insulin levels. Uh, definitely check out the episode why balancing blood sugar matters for fertility. Um, Cause having high blood pressure, having high blood sugar can compromise fertility. And this is, there's a nurse's health study. So it's an eight, eight year study, a Harvard study, studying over 18,000 nurses and talk about uh, complex carbs versus simple carbs. So the complex being those mul uh, multi-grain, simple being those cakes and cookies and sort of those white flour. So it can reduce ovulatory infertility and also insulin resistance has had a link to, it's significantly uh, increases the risk of miscarriage, plus it increases, plus it decreases IVF success rates. So getting the blood sugar imbalance is something we work on a lot. Uh, anything you wanted to say there, Brandy? Yeah. So blood sugar imbalance actually increases, can increase cortisol. So when you're, which is the stress hormone, which then sends the signals to the body that you're under attack and you need to, you know, it needs to be protective and we don't need to be producing hormones and reproduce if we're under a large amount of stress or we're under attack. And so that's why it's really important to really look at blood sugar balance and, and take it really seriously. High and low blood sugar or, you know, excessive amounts of sugar and carbohydrates can also lower your immune system, which is definitely going to impact your fertility. The best thing you can do if you're eating a standard American diet and eating a lot of packaged foods, switch to whole foods, you know, try to get foods in their natural form, stick to the outside perimeter of the grocery store. Movement is is important. Um, it's just it's just overall important, not only for yourself, but for your partners as well. Absolutely. The next one we have is sugar. I think we all know how sugar is inflammatory to the body. Um, and it also leads to fewer eggs retrieved and fewer good quality embryos. So we are looking at doing uh, no processed sugar. Conventional sugar can come from sugared beets, which are uh, highly genetically modified. You know, if you don't have a blood sugar issue, you can look at cane sugar, not a lot, but sometimes, and they have super coconut sugar and palm sugar and all of those, but really looking at sugar alternatives such as honey or maple syrup, unless there's a, a blood sugar issue. And then you can look at stevia and some other sugar sweetener al al alternatives. You wanted to say anything there about sugar? Yeah. So one of the, the misconceptions is out there is, oh, let's switch to the alternatives like agave or coconut sugar or, you know, even honey. And a lot of those are really high in fructose. And so fructose doesn't necessarily have a big impact on your blood sugar. So you think it's okay, but it does have an impact on the liver because it's processed by the liver and excessive amounts of those sugars can lead to things like fatty liver disease. Um, and so it's really important to be aware of excess amounts of fructose, even if it's not affecting your blood sugar levels per se, it's definitely having an impact. Um, I would definitely stick with things like stevia. Um, my favorite brand is the now brand stevia glycerate. Glycerite, so it's not in an alcohol, it's in a glycerin. Um, it doesn't have a bad aftertaste. You can get it anywhere. Um, I would be careful with some of the other alternatives out there like um, erythritol or monk fruit, uh, you know, like Swerve, Lakanto. I'm not saying anything negative against those companies, but um, some people tend to have issues with those sweeteners 
if they have them in excessive amounts, it can cause a lot of gas and bloating and gut discomfort. Every once in a while, that's fine in small amounts, but I wouldn't be replacing all of your regular sugar latent things with treats made with a bunch of erythritol or monk fruit or xylitol. Um, it's just going to cause havoc on your gut. And the next one we have, so we're talking about celiac, now we're digging into gluten and so on. In the book, it starts with the egg. She's recommending those with endometriosis, a history of recurrent miscarriage or pre-existing autoimmune disease, eliminate gluten. Our take is to take that a little bit further is we have both our, our partners start the elimination diet and that's taking out the top allergens. Definitely check out how and why to do an elimination diet, take you through the exact steps. As we're saying, a high percentage of people have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So it's not just, and if you have a sensitivity to gluten, there's the cross reactors like dairy and corn um, and the, the, the ones that Brendan was talking about. So we see this very regularly. You've got to be 100% and you can do anything for 10 days because the, the elimination diet is 10 days and then systematically reintroducing it over the course of 30 days. And so it's not about saying you're gluten-free and then like cheating because it, it's if, you're, if you are intolerant to it, even a crumb will then impact your cause inflammation in your body for a week to months later. So it is about being diligent with this to see how your body reacts to it. Yeah. So I'm, I mean, the best example that I can give of this is uh, two of my children. Two of my children are gluten sensitive and they have non-celiac gluten sensitivity. If they have a little bit, and this is even a gluten cross reactor, not necessarily gluten because we are strictly gluten free, they will get eczema on their skin that will take months to heal from one exposure. This is why it's really important to be diligent about it. If you know that you're sensitive to gluten, make your entire house gluten-free. If you have a spouse that's wanting to eat it in the house, it's time to have that test conversation because you can easily get cross-contaminated by sharing utensils, pots and pans, toasters, oven. There are so many things that, you know, it's so easily to get cross-contaminated. Um, and I mean, it's not that we don't want you enjoying life, but, you know, even thinking about when you're eating out at restaurants, it's very easily to become cross-contaminated there. I mean, we personally, I have celiac and two of my kids have gluten sensitivity. We just don't eat out. I know it sucks, but we bake our food at home and we know we're going to be okay. It's just not worth the skin rash or the headache or the bloating or whatever it is that you get. The nice thing is, is that there are more and more places out there. It's getting easier to find restaurants or bakeries or things like that that are dedicated gluten-free where you can go out and enjoy yourselves. And I would definitely choose those options um, to minimize your exposure. Absolutely. We're, we're all non-celiac gluten sensitivity, the four of us in the household as well. And I'm excited because my bakery is doing a curbside pickup and I've got a large order that I'm picking up on Saturday. I can't wait. <laughs> My gluten-free vegan bakery is ready for business. And the next one we have is dairy. So there are studies that saying those with a higher intake of dairy had a higher chance of live birth. Um, we are seeing people, with, again, with a high sensitivity to dairy as well when we're doing testing and also people remarking on symptoms when they're doing the elimination diet. So it starts with the egg, does talk about taking a no stone unturned approach and eliminating both dairy and gluten. We are saying to go deep with the elimination diet, which is dairy, gluten, soy, corn, peanuts, eggs, processed sugar for 10 days, and then systematically reintroduce. So as we see a lot of people that are off the chart with dairy. Yeah. And I mean, dairy can be a very dairy in its whole form. So I'm not a fan of like skim milk or 1% or anything like that, but whole full fat dairy can be very good for some people. It can be very nutrient dense. It has a lot of really great, you know, like grass fed butter has vitamin A and vitamin K2 and, and vitamin D. Like it's very nutrient dense if it works for you. Um, but unfortunately for a lot of people, they're just very sensitive and dairy has different components. So some people are lactose intolerant, um, which is the milk sugar. Some people um, are intolerant to the casein, which is the protein. So you really do have to judge whether or not it works for you. Uh, you know, you, you might, you know, follow something like the Weston A. Price Foundation, they're very big on preparing your body for at least one to two years before getting pregnant. And they include dairy as part of that. If it works for you, go for it. But if it doesn't, just be honest with yourself and avoid it. And some of the most common symptoms with dairy is issues with your sinuses, post-nasal drip, flemminess, skin rash, brain fog, 
gas and bloating. Those are some pretty big common symptoms of um, dairy intolerance. In there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not fun. But once you, again, if you identify these issues and for yourself, so if it is, if there is an issue for you, then you can, then you can do something about it. So it's empowering. Um, so in the book, she's also talking about the Mediterranean diet. So 2008, uh, 18 studies talking about inflammation due to infertility or miscarriage. Doing the Mediterranean diet can boost IVF rates. Our, our thinking here is we're talking about, is that diet right for you? So there's great parts of the Mediterranean diet, but is that diet right for you? So really tweaking this with the elimination diet, going deeper into food sensitivity testing and doing a diet that's right for you. Yeah. So the Mediterranean diet is really, it's very anti-inflammatory and has some really amazing foods. And for a lot of people, it really works. But like you said, you know, if you have a histamine problem, you may not be able to handle avocados, which are amazing. So it's really not taking everything by a blanket recommendation, but personalizing it for your situation. Absolutely. And then as part of the Mediterranean diet, the fats and oils, oils and I'm sorry, fats are building block, blocks for your, your hormones. And really with the Mediterranean diet, looking at fish, nuts, and olive oils, it leads to a higher quality of embryos, wild caught fish, of course. Anything you wanted to say there about fats and oils? I think there's there's been years of us being, you know, I did that whole low fat craze, years of mm -hmm. us being afraid of fat. I think it's coming back into now that, you know, we know that it can be healthy, but we still are seeing when we're doing food diaries, because from when we start the program, we have both our, our couples do the... Um, a food diary and we can regularly see that they may not get enough fat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And fats are important as long as you're getting the right kind of fat. So, I mean, you definitely want to be avoiding the highly processed manufactured vegetable oils like corn, canola, soy, cottonseed, safflower, sunflower, you know, and opt for other oils like olive oil, avocado oil, olive oil, I would use cold, so I wouldn't use it for cooking. Mm -hmm. um, avocado oil has a really good smoke point, so you can definitely use that for cooking. Things like coconut oil, animal fats are really stable at room temperature. I mean, I know a lot of people are scared of them, but it used to be that um, French fries and McDonald's were fried in tallow. And so, and then before switching to a vegetable oil. So those are really stable and can be nourishing, but just really focusing on high quality oils. Um, one thing I will say about nuts, nuts can be really good, but they can also be high in omega-6s which can be inflammatory. And if you eat too many nuts, it could affect your gut. So um, if your gut's already sensitive and inflamed from other food sensitivities or maybe some pathogens, nuts may make that worse. So something to keep in mind. Now, the next one we have is AIP diet. So we've talked a lot about it on the podcast about the efficacy of the AIP diet um, is for Hashimoto's, irritable bowel disease. So Crohn's and colitis, there's some studies that were published back in 2019. And uh, so definitely check out if you um, just check out the AIP diet and infertility on the podcast. So if there's a history of autoimmunity, endometriosis, miscarriage, uh, we've seen success with um, POF or POI and low AMH doing an AIP diet. So anything you wanted to say there, Brandy? Yeah. So the philosophy with the autoimmune protocol is removing as many in inflammatory foods as you can and really kind of giving your body a break and allowing it to calm down the inflammation, calm down the immune system and allow the body to do what it needs to do and knows what it knows to do because it innately wants to be in balance and it innately wants to be healing. It is a, a pretty restrictive diet. So I generally don't recommend the autoimmune diet long term because it can be really restrictive. But, you know, for about three months, um, you know, when you allow the immune system to calm down, if you want to start introducing slowly, you can definitely do that, but it can be very effective for some people. Yeah. And so in the book, um, there's a section on male factor infertility and sperm health. So making sure taking a multivitamin, we're going to talk about um, supplements in a minute, but CoQ10, Omega, dealing with those env environmental toxins, these are linked to low sperm count. So your, your BPAs, your phthalates, your, um, your EMF, looking at diet. So when we, when we do this, it's both partners doing the elimination diet. It's not just the female making all these changes. The partner is, is doing that because 
50% of this is male factor infertility, even though it starts the egg is focusing on the egg, it takes two to have a baby. Also with sperm count, so pesticides, there was studies talking about if you didn't have produce that had pesticides, there was 169% higher sperm count and 173% higher sperm concentration. Sw switching to an organic diet is definitely key for both partners. Um, alcohol, uh, I see this a lot with, you know, the female partner's done all these changes and he's still, again, this is generalizing, this is not your case, but he's still drinking alcohol. So there is reduced IVF success rate and increased miscarriage when um, the male partner is continuing to consume alcohol. And then looking at filtering your water and also your your lubricant can have a negative impact on sperm. So in, in the book, she's talking about pre-seed has the less the least negative impact on sperm. Anything like this is a whole other podcast on for, for men. I have done other podcasts on the uh, other episodes on the podcast talking about male fertility, but anything you wanted to say there, maybe about the multi for, for, for men. Yeah, I mean, I definitely have a lot of experience with this. So one of the things that my husband and I did before um, we had our twins, which was our first, is both of us actually embarked on organic, dairy clean, nutrient dense foods. Um, you know, he was taking a multivitamin. We were, um, you know, adding in things that we knew helped boost fertility. So we were both on the same page, cleaning up the personal care products, all of those things. And it definitely have an impact. I mean, we weren't, we didn't go through IVF, but we became pregnant with twins. And I, we really do feel like it was all of that prep work that we did for six months before we started trying that really had an impact for both of us. So it wasn't just me, it was both of us doing it. So I think it's important that both partners are on board. Absolutely. And okay, let's go. Anything you wanted to say about the, the, the multi for men? Um, so I think it's important for men to get a multivitamin just because it's hard to get nutrients solely in the diet. And the ones for men um, are going to have important nutrients for them, specifically things like zinc for the health of the sperm, um, um, less iron because men tend to not need iron. They hold iron better than women. Um, so, you know, you definitely want to pick a good quality multivitamin. And I think it can be helpful, like I said, because it's hard to get all the nutrients that you need from food. And so it starts with the egg, the book, um, as well as the website has a list of supplements. So I'm just going to go through some of these supplements here. And again, when we develop a protocol, it's based on functional testing. And then we develop a protocol um, a target protocol for a period of time. There are some basic supplements that we would recommend long term, but it's that's only a handful. Most of the ones we're recommending, it's based on testing. It's for a short period of time. Um, one of the, one of the basic supplements we're going to recommend is prenatal. Um, this I th I think a lot of people are knowing knowing now that it's it's no longer folic acid that you need to have methylated folate. Most people I speak with have made this change and. And in the book, it starts with the egg. She is talking about that because with the MTHFR gene variant, which is your reduced ability to convert folate to the active methylfolate, you want to make sure that you have a methylated folate um, prenatal. We like Thorn Basic as, as does, it starts with the egg author, Rebecca. And also we like seeking health and also having the, sure that the male partner is taking a methylfolate. Yeah. I mean, those are two, there's some, a lot of really amazing brands, but definitely our two favorites are Seeking Health and Thorn. They have a really good quality prenatal um, and quality does matter. You're not going to want to go to Walmart or Costco or CVS and um, just get whatever's on the shelf there. I mean, quality does matter when it comes to a prenatal. So it is worth paying a little bit more for high quality. And so B12, so where's the, there's a study found that high B12 has better embryo quality. Uh, B12 decreases homocysteine levels and also B6 increases the likelihood of pregnancy. Um, so low levels, there's a high instance of miscarriage. Can you just talk about what we're seeing with B, uh, with B12 levels? Um, B12, again, can be a rabbit hole complicated conversation, but many times we actually see many women low in B12. And a lot of times, um, that has to do with low stomach acid and poor digestion. Um, it's really hard to get good quality amounts of B12 from um, 
non-animal sources. The same is true with iron. I know we're talking about iron, but you do need to have good quality stomach acid and good quality digestion to absorb B12. I have seen some instances where women are supplementing with B12. This is definitely my instance. If I supplement with B12, it goes really high in the blood. Um, and that doesn't mean that my levels are good. It's just that my cells aren't able to use it because I do have MTHFR. Um, I'm homozygous for, so both copies basically. It's best for me to get it from food. And to do that, I need to work on my digestion and my stomach acid. And um, I tend to not take high levels of B12. I rely what's on a, in a multi and really add in foods that are high in B12. The next one we have is CoQ10. And I'd say the majority of people that come to us are taking CoQ10. This has kind of been quite popularized that it's helpful for egg health and a whole host of other things with, with the body. But basically, with poor mitochondria function, so someone like someone that may have POF or POI and, and poor responders to IBF. So um, a high performing mitochondria is the hallmark of egg quality. So it, it um, will increase the energy supply to, to fuel the egg development. And a study of CoQ10 one to two months prior to IVF increases egg quality and recommending uh, ubiquinol. And those with infertility may have low blood pressure, so adrenal dysfunction, so it may be good for blood sugar control. Anything you want to say say there about CoQ10? Yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert on CoQ10, but I do know it's really important for mitochondrial health, um, which is the energy production of the cell. One question that you would want to ask yourself is that if you do have poor mitochondrial health, is why. Yeah. So, I mean, CoQ10 is helpful. Um, you, you see a lot of people as we age, we make less CoQ10. Um, so, you know, supplementation is not harmful. Um, we don't tend to have it as like a top recommendation because most people are already taking it and we don't want to have like bags full of supplements. Mm -hmm. But it can be helpful and you do kind of want to ask yourself, why is why do I have poor mitochondrial health? What else is going on that I can work on to improve the mitochondria? Absolutely. Def definitely check out why mitochondria health is so important for, for fertility on the episode and the podcast. So you can you can search that. Um, the next thing we have is oxidative stress. So basically higher oxidative stress is a lower chance of egg making it to blastocysts. The oxidative stress is higher with people with PCOS, so insulin resistant and higher blood sugar. Some of the things to improve oxidative stress, we're going to talk about those now. The first one is melatonin. So the book does say it can help with IVF. It has an important role in ovulation and higher melatonin levels can lead to a higher AMH and a higher follicle count. But before supplementing, uh, it, it will impact the body's ability to produce melatonin. This is not the case if you're going through IVF because large doses of hormones are given artificially to regulate the cycle. So let's talk about melatonin and what we regularly see. Melatonin is a powerful antioxidant. It We make it while we're sleeping. So if you have high levels or good levels of, of melatonin, your body is detoxifying as you sleep. If you don't have good melatonin levels, then your body's not able to get into that deep restorative detoxing sleep. It's always best for you to get it naturally. And so there's a lot of things that can affect your melatonin production. Cortisol, so high cortisol, high stress. Cortisol blocks melatonin production. Lots of blue light or uh, too much light exposure at the end of the day can block melatonin production. Um, if you have any blood sugar imbalances while you're sleeping, the cortisol is going to go up and that's going to shut down melatonin production. Gut pathogens are actually more active at night and around the full moon. And so you may find that you don't sleep well at night or you fall asleep easily and wake up in the middle of the night. Um, and that could be, again, a stressor, which then is blocking melatonin production. So there are some instances where supplementing with melatonin can be beneficial. Although I personally am not a fan of supplementing long-term because it might send the signal to your body not to produce its own. So we, we spend a lot of time working on sleep hygiene um, and sleep routines so that you can naturally boost your body's own production of melatonin and you're getting that good quality sleep so that your body's able to detoxify while you're sleeping. And we run the, the Dutch test. And so this will give us the um, this is a look at your hormones using urine and it'll look at your melatonin. And we very literally see people that are supplementing and it's off the chart, which is not, not, a, not a good thing either. And the question we had on this actually, the difference between melatonin and 5-HTP and should you take either of them? 
Yeah, so 5-HTP is a precursor for serotonin. And so 5-HTP can actually produce serotonin, which then um, has that downstream effect that it can help to produce melatonin and help with sleep. So serotonin... Um, helps calm the body down. So 5-HTP can be used, but again, it's something where I wouldn't use 5-HTP as a crutch long-term. You definitely want to be testing. Um, and the thing with 5-HTP is that um, if you're taking it and you feel good for a while, and then all of a sudden you stop feeling good, that's a sign that your body has had enough and you might be taking too much. Um, so it's definitely different. It's not the same thing. And so vitamin E, uh, which is the studies in the book talking about helping with uterine life, uh, lining. This can be in a prenatal. Anything you want to say about vitamin E? So I'll just kind of talk about oxidative stress really quickly because I think that will lead into some of the antioxidants that um, that we're going to talk about. So the best example I can give for oxidative stress is you cut an apple and then it turns brown. It's because the apple was exposed to the air and it was oxidized. And so that can happen in the body if we're not getting enough antioxidants, which, you know, help keep the body healthy. And too much oxidation damages your cells and can damage DNA. So that's why it's important to get antioxidants. Now we can get plenty of antioxidants by having a wide variety of fresh fruits and vegetables and foods. Um, but some of the most common supplemental antioxidants are going to be things like vitamin E, like you're talking about our lipoic acid, uh, alpha lipoic acid. Those are some really common antioxidants. Vitamin C is an antioxidant. Um, so that's likely why a lot of those are being recommended for fertility if oxidation is a problem. Um, and like you said, we do use the Dutch test with our clients and there is a marker of oxidative stress on there. So if we see that high, um, then we will work with people to either add in antioxidants or add more antioxidant rich foods into their diet. Chemical exposure, secondhand smoke, those types of things are some of the more, more common reasons, but uh, you know, a poor diet can also lead to um, oxidative stress. Right. And so, and vitamin C is a shorter time for pregnancy for women over the healthy weight and under 35 people taking vitamin C. Again, I think so, like some of these, if you're taking each supplement, can be like a reductionist view of the whole body. We're looking at the whole body using testing to dig into it. Obviously, vitamin C can be helpful. Um, anything you want to say there on vitamin C? Yeah. So, vitamin C is kind of, it's good for the immune system. It's very supportive supportive to the adrenal glands, um, which helps with the stress response. So it is a good all around um, nutrient. You just want to make sure you're getting a good quality vitamin C from fruits and vegetables. You can get vitamin C in high amounts from there. It's, I, I don't think it's, it's negative for anybody. <laughs> I think everybody would benefit from vitamin C. And yeah, and a lot of times we're, when we're looking at the testing, we're then recommending um, dietary changes too, simple things that you can just add into your diet, ne not necessarily always taking the supplement approach. Alpha lipoic acid, so it helps with hormonal irregularities such as PCOS, reduces inflammation, benefits with miscarriage, endometriosis. Anything you wanted to say there? Yeah, so alpha lipoic acid is an antioxidant, like I mentioned. So it can be helpful um, to combat oxidative stress. And it's just like that extra level of detoxification in antioxidant. <laughs> it helps the antioxidant status. The next one is the, okay, I'm not gonna be able to pronounce this one. And acetyl cysteine. And Acetylcysteine. Yep. So N-acetylcysteine is a precursor for glutathione. Um, glutathione is a master antioxidant made in the liver. And so N-acetylcysteine can be helpful if you're not producing enough glutathione, which is an indication that you know, there's some liver burden, which we've talked about all along, um, you know, with environmental stressors and too much sugar, too much fructose, and all of those things. Um, and again, when we look at the um, we look at the Dutch test, there is a marker for glutathione on there, so we can see how your glutathione is doing. And a lot of times, whenever we work with somebody, we will um, recommend a liver support supplement, and N-acetylcysteine is usually something that's included in that supplement. And that just decreases miscarriage in women with PCOS by sixty percent and reduces pain and cysts associated with endo. And the next one we have so myo inositol, so which helps with PCOS, restores ovulation, improves egg quality, prevents digest um, gest gestational diabetes. 
Anything you wanted to say with that? Yeah, so my inositol is a B vitamin um, and it is really helpful for insulin sensitivity. So um, we do see this a lot with people with PCOS. They have um, insulin issues or blood sugar issues. So my inositol can be really helpful to improve insulin sensitivity, which also has a really big impact on fertility. I've got a question here. Will it help with repeat pregnancy loss or diminished ovarian reserve? My inositol itself, I don't think it would. That's something where you definitely want to dig deep deeper into what else is going on. I would say in situations like that, there's no one supplement that's going to fix that. Digging deeper. DHEA, we regularly see that people are supplementing for with DHEA if they have diminished ovarian reserve. It's recommended for uh, those that are preparing for IVF and it may decrease miscarriage by increasing the number of chromosomally normal eggs. And also DOR also overlaps with poor responders. So a lower uh, success rate with IVF. So they're typically doing a DHEA potentially with Clomid. Let's, this is something that we see a lot. So can you talk about why a blood test for DHEA S and testosterone is not enough? So DHEA is the precursor hormone. So um, you can make D, take DHEA and make estrogen or testosterone or progesterone. And so that's why it's often used because it's a precursor rather than using testosterone or estrogen or estradiol or progesterone itself. What happens is, is you know, somebody will give um, a client DHEA and hope that it balances the other hormones. Um, if you are supplementing with DHEA, you want to make sure that you are checking your hormones on a regular basis. Um, now with blood testing, you know, there are some good reasons to use blood testing at certain times of the cycle, but it is only telling you what's available in your blood at that moment in time. So it doesn't always tell you everything that's going on. Um, and I have actually seen a lot of people who have side effects from DHEA, um, like headaches, and they just don't feel well. So if you are taking DHEA, you want to make sure you know why and you're having follow-up testing on a regular basis to see what's happening with your hormones. Are you taking that DHA and converting it to a bunch of testosterone and that's not what you want. So it's important to see how your body's utilizing the DHEA. Yeah, because the side effects can be oily skin, oily hair, hair loss, acne. Mm -hmm. um, and the last one is L-carnitine. So in the book, it talks about using this for sperm health. Um, it also can be used for PCOS. Studies in indicates it improves ovulation, insulin sensitivities, and regular ovulation and improves sperm motility by 8% and morphology by 5%. This is not something that we typically recommend. Anything you wanted to say there? Yeah, so acetyl-L-carnitine um, can be something that's recommended to help with lipid absorption and utilization. So if you're not utilizing fats correctly, um, acetyl-L-carnitine can really help with that. And as we already talked about, fats are really important for hormone production. You know, it's also an important component for producing sperm. So, if, you know, if you want to, you're not utilizing fats well, then then um, acetyl-L-carnitine can be helpful. So obviously there's a lot of good research in the book. It starts with the A, but remember these are generalized guidelines. And so as I was talking about it, it can take a reductionist viewpoint of fertility and we're looking at the whole body, not focusing on the symptoms. So just want to talk a little bit about the fab fertile method. So as we we're talking about, we're doing functional testing, food sensitivity testing, hormone testing using urine, stool testing, looking at the DNA of your stool, looking for gut infections, hair tissue, mineral analysis testing. We're talking about you can eat that really beautiful, nutrient-dense, healthy diet, but maybe your body's not absorbing these foods. We regularly see this. If, if you've been on hormonal long-term birth, birth control, we see for the hair tissue mineral analysis testing, we see people that are eating this beautiful, healthy diet, but they're not absorbing the uh, minerals in the foods that can regularly be the case for people that were on hormonal birth control and so that predisposes you to gut food, um, gut infections food sensitivities and not being able to absorb the nutrients so those are the four tests we're doing food sensitivity testing uh, stool testing hormone testing hair testing we're also doing a blood chemistry review and it's not to it's not to diagnose it's to educate to really figure out well what's been missed here when you've been told that your blood chemistry is normal, or maybe you haven't, you've been told there, there's some areas for improvement, but you're not sure what to do next. So that's the functional testing we're doing. And then we're really looking at the, the, the foundations of the, the, the basics on this. And sometimes we get focused on doing supplements and other things and forgetting the basics. So the basics are looking at the diet. And in this case, the diet that's right for you, if you have a high sensitivity to gluten and it's coming in every 
you know, every day that's causing inflammation in your body and that can impact your fertility. Uh, looking at sleep, we've talked about with me- melatonin, um, obviously the sponsor of my podcast are blue light blocking ga- uh, glasses. So really um, being able to protect yourself from green and blue light, which then impacts your melatonin production for both male and, fe- and females. Um, looking at, so sleep hygiene is key. We work on it for months movement so the right movement for you stress um looking at mental emotional stress and also the stress from a gut infection and food sensitivity but first of all getting honest about your stressors um busy job you know toxic relationships trauma uh, associated with infertility or or trauma in your childhood um that's unresolved so being able to address those is key so you really can't out supplement these basics and although a lot of people come to us and it's like what's the supplement Supplements, you know, let's do the testing and there, there is a supplement protocol. The basics are key. And as we say, the stressors, it's the diet that's right for you. It's addressing those gut infections. We regularly see people with unexplained infertility, low AMH, POI, POF, and endo, you know, repeat miscarriage, whatever diagnosis it may be with gut infections, be it parasites, fungal infections, worms, bacterial infections. Um, the environmental toxins that we talked about. So those personal care, your cleaning products, being able to um, minimize your your exposure to these. And the stressors we just talked about, the m- mental emotional stress and the structural stress. If you are in a car accident or if you have a pinched nerve or something's out of alignment, that's causing stress on your body. So being able to, l- to look at the testing, work on those, 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 fu- those fundamental uh, things such as diet, sleep, movement, and stress digging more into the stressors. And the key to all of this is really including your partner. It's 50-50 for female and male infertility. It is not just you making all these changes. Your partner needs to be in this with you. And if he's not ready, you can start by leading by example. And you can never drag someone over to to the finish line, but you lead by example. And when he sees you starting to make these changes, typically he will he will come over. But it's it takes two to prepare your body for a baby, and it's and it also helping to have both of you on the same page. So it's really um, from a um, a physical like both of you guys eating together, doing the elimination diet together. You're both cooking together. Both of you, you know, you may have put joy on hold, you know, as you prepare your, your, your body for a baby, it could be just the singular focus of your relationship and all the things, the intimacy, all the things you guys love to do together. You may have stopped doing that. I did a, a episode on how to optimize your fertility by including your partner. I really, I really highly recommend to listen to that, but including the partner is key to the, the success of the program. So that is the fat fertile method. And so really next steps after you've read the book, it starts with the egg and you've made made the changes and it hasn't worked, I would recommend if this feels right for you to book your free call and we take a targeted, customized approach to your fertility, which includes your partner. All you need to do is go to fabfertile, fabfertile.com and click on book a free call. And thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you again next time. Melatonin is important for female fertility. It helps regulate hormones and maintain the body's circadian rhythms. Plus it helps determine the frequency and duration of the menstrual cycle. Plus it impacts sperm count and motility. Blue and green light negatively impact our melatonin production. That's why we recommend blue blocks, blue and green light sleep glasses to all our one-to-one clients. Simply go to blueblocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com and use the coupon code Get pregnant podcast at checkout to receive your 15% discount. That's blueblocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com and use the coupon code getpregnantpodcast. Hey there, I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have two spots available per month to work with us. So the Supercharger Fertility Discovery Call is for action takers, really people who are ready to move forward so they can finally have their baby. And if you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. So if you're seriously considering working with us, go to fabfertile, F-A-B, fertile.com and click on book a free Call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. That's fabfertile, F A B fertile.com, and click on book a free call. The Get Pregnant Naturally podcast, including show notes and links, provides information with respect to healthy living, nutrition, 
lab testing, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without representation or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified health care provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.